Because when you're programming, there's always things that can, or unforeseen circumstances that can happen, and some of them lie in your field. So as a programmer, you sometimes need to be checking things, but perhaps you're in, uh, in, in need of time for that, or you don't have the time for this. And in other cases, you can't always predict what users or devices will deliver as pieces of information, as uh, values, and therefore also there some things might go wrong. And for those, of, uh, for those situations, we have a couple of tools to our availability, and that's what we'll now discuss in section nine. And the first thing is a very old fashioned thing that is coming from C. Uh, it's called assert. Assert looks like a function, so that's the bolting up there. Um, it's actually a macro, but that doesn't play a really big role here unless we're really looking for every byte and efficiency. And it's something that we can use to assert a certain uh, thing in, the, in our program up until certain points. That means as a programmer, if you want to make sure that, for instance, a value is adhering to a certain condition, then you can do this with a search, a search. And this is typically something that you as a programmer quickly do for yourself so that errors that you make are then afterwards in a nicer way displayed while this uh, thing is running. That is um, the, the, whole, the whole meaning of an assertion. So if somewhere in a program or everywhere in a program, you could call or you could say assert this, and this means you can then uh, look for a condition there or a, a Boolean uh, that basically tests something that you don't have time for at the moment while you're developing and while you're trying things out. Now, if this assertion is not true as this program is running, so it will compile in that case, and as it's running, as it's running, the assertion will then be checked. And if this is not the case, then your program will immediately abort and say this assertion was wrong. Assertion is kind of an assumption that you make, right? So I assert that a particular variable, a variable is uh, within those and those limits, for instance. Um, so if I get the month back from a system or from a user, then I'm assuming I get a number between 1 and 12. So you can add as an assertion then that this variable is smaller than 13 and bigger than 0. If at some point later I made a mistake and the value that I get is between 0 and 11, for instance, because some functions do deliver that, then I will get an error on this assertion. And I won't get this error later where it can be a little bit more masked and a little bit harder to track. So that is the, the deal with an assertion. And for this, we have this example right here um, where I start with seeding for my uh, random uh, um, uh, value that I want to get later on. So this is seeding uh, the random number generator with the current time. That's what this means. I have a couple of uh, links there that show you what, it, what the background of this uh, is, but it's, it's fairly simple. We have here um, a, a time with a null pointer being initialized, this object, and this is then given to the function s rand, which then is seeding the random number generator that we uh, have um, in our C++ program, and which we, in this case, call over here with rand. That's something we already done, right? So we have here a random number. This is going through an, an enormous range, but we limit this uh, from, the, from 0 to 3 with our model operator, right? So we make sure that whatever integer we get back from here is between 0 and 3. And then we do minus 2 to get my value. Now, this is something that is a little bit complicated. We don't really immediately see what value this could take. Well, not the, I mean, in a few seconds, or if you just take a few seconds, you will see it. But uh, it's a little bit masked. So my value here is something that I take, and I, for instance, then want to um, use to divide a number by. So if I have a particular number in my, later in my code, like 5, and I want to divide this by my value, then of course I want to make sure that this value is not 0. Otherwise, this thing would then leave our, our, our would, would generate some very strange errors later, most likely. So because of that, I can do assert that my value is not zero. And that's what I'm doing here. And that makes sure that if this assertion, or, or if this assertion is wrong, so if my value is zero or can be zero, and in, a few, or in just a few seconds you probably have realized that this can actually be zero, then in that case the assertion will uh, terminate the program and then you know where it came from. 
it's not then a problem that you have later because in that case my value will in this case get a very strange value um, and this strange value will then print as infinity and if you then in your program um, uh, continue to work with infinity then strange things might occur and the errors that then occur or the runtime errors that uh, this program then um, leads to are usually a lot harder to to track down so your assertion in that case is kind of a shortcut I assume here that my value is zero, so I take assert my value is not zero. Right? That is, that is the, the use of such an assertion. So I have my uh, assertion, and if I don't leave it here, then what will happen? So basically, I first have to, uh, I have to go for uh, exceptions first. Then I go for my example, so I compile my example 0, 0, so that's the one. And I will, um, I will have generated A out in that case as the standard, or oh, let me increase this, this window size so you can see it better. Right, so now I uh, created my executable from this, and if I execute this, it could go right, right? So in this case, my value was not 0. Here it's also not 0. Here it's also not zero, but ah, here. Here it was uh, zero, and therefore I write out as the value infinity. Right? And that would have been leading to problems most likely later on. That's something we don't want. So because of that, we add our assertion, and if we then recompile and execute, and we'll wait until the value comes zero again, then now we have a much better way to track down where the problem was. Again, the, uh, the owner is here on the programmer to make sure that he or she is and really taking care to put in enough assertions to help in later, down, uh, later on tracking these errors. Okay? So that is what the use of an assertion is. Um, it's, as I said, it's a macro. It's not really a function, even though there's a, the, the look of a function, but that's not the important part. You can, with ndebug, also turn this on and off. So basically, if you, in the beginning of your program, before you call assert, and you do that with this library, C assert, that's how you see that it's actually a C library, and it's a standard one because of the smaller than bigger than uh, braces. So basically, if you then also define ndebug before that, then all assertions will be turned off uh, and will be disabled. That's sometimes uh, interesting or sometimes good because you don't want a running program to do all these assertions as well because also that is a little bit of an overhead. Not a very big one, but a little bit. And you can turn those off at will in that case. You don't have to remove them by hand by yourself. Now, at this point, it's also um, very interesting, I think, to also look at debuggers. <coughs> That's something we haven't talked about at all, but I'm assuming most of you will have an IDE where the debugger is built in. You can set breakpoints, you can run the program until those breakpoints and look at what is going on. Um, those usually use uh, available debugger programs, um, uh, like the ones that I listed over here anyway, and so you can also do that on the command line. Uh, just to show you how that works is basically, and what is happening in the background of those IDEs, is when you compile for a debugger, you have to add a particular option in this case. For G++, so GCC, there is a minus G. That means over here you generate extra material, extra information, so that the debugger can also look at the, um, the executable, but also at the original source code and then build lists of how things would look or what things would look like in memory. And then um, you can use multiple. This one is a very nice one because it uses a web browser as an interface, so you don't have to install anything. I'm going to use this one now, LLDB, but really they're all very similar, and there's a few of them only. And most IDEs just use one of these. Um, so I'm using this as, as uh, the exa from the example that we just had. So I'm going to make it a little bit bigger again. Um, in this case, so uh, I again compile our uh, previous uh, e example, but as I said, we have to compile with minus G. And only then we will see an extra directory appear, which is this one over here, with the name of our executable. And you can see that it's a directory. right? So you can even go into this directory and then look what the contents are. Um, 
oops, a.out, sim, contents, power resources, for instance, the relocations. And then there will be some files over there that will kind of describe what is happening in your executable and what uh, libraries, for instance, are being called, where those libraries are, etc. So there are these type of files that are being generated by your um, by your minus G uh, option in that case. So that is, those are the things that you get on top, right? Um, and when we then um, launch uh, our debugger, so now we can launch it. So LLDB um, on our executable. Then it uh, creates our executable as a target in that case. So now we know that the executable is then linked with the directory that we just saw. That is what is basically happening. And then through the command line, we can then start creating a breakpoint for the main function, for instance. So bmain will do exactly that. So as soon as main, the main function starts, we now have a breakpoint. You can even see at which line and which column this will be uh, inside our original source code. And then we can run our program with run to then uh, generate the typical thing you can visually then see in an IDE. So this is the underlying executable that does this, right? So uh, we now ended up on line six um, and the first line where our main function starts. And in most, so this is the, the bare bones interface. You can also go into a GUI which uses n curses, by the way, the thing that we've been always been using in our um, maze example, to go into a more familiar uh, debugger, as I hope you kind of already probably checked out, right? So uh, in this one, you can with tap and switch between windows. You can then look at uh, the original source code, you know, the generated uh, assembly um, or the, the main function. Over here, you can get all the values that you would have. Our program is just using one variable, which is my value. And in this case, it has a very random value still. Um, and then with S, we can step into the different lines and then see that my value then changes its value. And also here, you would be able then to see that my value would be sometimes zero. And that way you can check with a debugger what is happening at which point in time. Right? And that is, of course, what you typically do in most IDEs as well. And these IDEs use exactly these type of programs. So an interface to these programs to make it a bit more visual in the editor code usually. Uh, but the difference is, I mean, it's basically the same, right? So that's how you can, um, you can deal with that and, uh, and, and then debug your code even on the command line as we just saw. And then with Q, we quit. And then uh, this way we can kind of dig into our codes and look at the many options that you would have there for looking at watches um, and, and looking at certain exceptions, go into particular functions, etc. All right, so that is just an illustration of the debugger. I also have kind of the screenshot of that, so you could also um, redo this at home if you want to. But of, of course, you can also use the other ones or obviously the ones in your integrated development environments. So if you use Visual C, uh, or Xcode, all these things are, of course, built in. However, they are linked to exactly these type of programs, so in the essence, they are exactly the same. And then you have these type of uh, outputs, as we just saw. All right, now assertions are one way for the programmer to make sure that while the program is running, the program stops at an assertion, so that the programmer then afterwards can see where things went wrong in a very coordinated, nice fashion. That is what an assertion does. It's basically for us developers to fix our codes. It means that we made a mistake somewhere, a, a, a thought uh, error. Exceptions, and that's what this chapter is about, are really about things you can't foresee as a programmer. If you assume that as your, your software package has a particular file that it depends on, like the maze uh, text uh, uh, file that uh, we used last time, and it is not there, then we'll have a problem. However, this is not our fault. It could be that a, a certain user has then so, uh, suddenly deleted this file, right? So it's, it's something that could happen, um, but where uh, we don't always can predict whether it's happening or not. So it's not really lying in, uh, on our side, typically. Um, 
Also, another example is when you uh, not just look at file systems, but other types of hardware that need to respond at a certain time with a particular protocol. Sometimes things go wrong, and then you need to recover from that. Now, if you don't do this, if you don't deal with this with exceptions, then your program crashes. And that is obviously bad. Um, if your program, however, does not crash, uh, or what is happening uh, on the lower level is that exceptions are thrown by things we use as, uh, from the libraries that we have and that those are not caught. And if they're not caught, your program crashes with a particular error code that hopefully will be meaningful and that, uh, that we can then use. However, with exceptions, while it is in the hands of the user and while it's being used, we can actually handle then exceptions in a very nice and orchestrated manner. And that is what exceptions are. And this is completely different to assertions, right? Assertions, it's our fault. Exceptions, it's the user's fault, in a way. Um, so this is how uh, you do this. You have usually a block of codes, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this already, that starts with try. That means everything that follows the try block that is within the curly braces are one or multiple statements. And within those statements, you could call functions from other libraries and those functions or methods, they could uh, throw an error or throw an exception. Um, you could yourself throw also an exception within this block. So there's multiple ways there things can go wrong and exceptions could be uh, arising. So basically an exception is suddenly something that pops up. If no exception pops up, it's great because in that case, we don't need to catch anything and uh, the, the code that you would have over here would resume after the last catch statement and everything is fine. If there's no exceptions, everything is fine. If there are exceptions thrown in the try block, however, then what uh, C++ will do for you at runtime is we'll match this with a different catch statement that we have following the try block. So typically have multiple, and the one that matches the closest to the exception that was thrown is then the one that gets executed. And this is very similar to how C++ uh, looks at uh, which function to call. If you have a function and you um, overload this uh, with particular other functions with the same name but different signatures, well, this is exactly the same. It looks usually at the type of exception. And if what the exception is is a floating point, then you catch it over here because that is a floating point. If you over here had a completely different type of uh, thing, like an integer or some other class, an object of some other class, then it would catch this somewhere else. And what you could also do is have the default way of writing. So catch, open braces, dot, 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 close braces means everything else. So if you haven't caught it yet up until this point, it will still write exception. But we don't that know that much about the exception because we didn't catch it explicitly. So that's the only thing we can do over here. So that's the default catch uh, clause that we have in this case. Um, if we wouldn't have this, and we would throw something else than a floating point over here, then our program would crash. Or not crash, it would uh, be terminated. Right? Because there an exception was raised, and this exception was not handled. And that's exactly uh, what your program will say as well in that case. Now, what throw is throwing is of a particular type, I already said. And in the uh, last slide, we use a float, but it could be any type of uh, type that we have seen so far, so also classes. And that is why the nicer way of doing this in C++ is to use something that belongs to a class that is specifically made for exceptions. And of course, that is already there. So C++ has already a standard exception class, which is hierarchically, hierarchically constructed so that you can have all types of, of exceptions. Most of the exceptions that you can think of, of are already there as a child class or a base class of a base class of a base class of exception, of standard exception, typically. So when you throw something typically in a C++ program, you don't throw something like a Boolean or an integer or a float. No, you throw something that is of a particular standard exception class uh, um, uh, object. And that is what, is what is happening here. So when we throw this thing over here, this is here, a constructor, for a runtime error. And the runtime error is a child class or a base class of the exception class. So what we do here is we create an object of class runtime 
we fill this object or initialize it with this particular message over here, and then we throw it. And then when we try to catch it later on, because also see here that this is a function that we first create, but then that we call over here, so this function over here might call this particular thing over here that needs to be catched or caught, sorry, caught. Um, and when we catch this, um, we need to have this particular exception. Now, what is important, what is interesting here is since this is a runtime error, um, we create an object of type runtime error. But last week we saw when we have this something of, of a child class, we can also treat this as something that is more generic, more general, like something of the base class. And that's exactly what we do here. We look at all the objects that are objects of child classes or objects of this particular class. And that's how we can, um, for instance, have this what function over here, which belongs, uh, which is a method that belongs to every class that is a child class of exception and the class itself as well. And we can call this in a polymorphic manner because it's basically being overwritten uh, for whatever we have. Right, so that is uh, how, how this works with, uh, with the exception class. You can yourself, if there is no exception that, uh, that you can have to your availability from standard C++, you can of course create your own. And the way to do that is to derive it from the standard exception class. So just as we saw last time, you can create your own class, which you give it a certain name, a name that is, points to the exception that is specifically valid for your program. And then you say this derives everything from, our, from the C++ standard exception class. And then certain things you need to implement, like the what member uh, uh, method, so the, uh, the what function. Um, and there are some things that you also then need to adhere to, for instance, how you then create a constructor. In the last slide, we saw that if you have a constructor of this exception, you can also pass then directly the message that belongs to this uh, exception, which you then initialize. Um, and that's basically it. So this is then kind of uh, inheriting everything from exception and overwriting the what method, as we saw already before. So if I want to use my own exception, I can in that case, when I uh, have my try block here, very condensed because I wanted to keep this on one slide, when I throw this, I throw this as an object. So this over here is creating an object of class my exception um, without a name, I'm just throwing it. And this will be caught over here. In this case, I explicitly ask for my exception in this case, not just any standard exception from C++. Just as yet another uh, example of what you could do. And since these classes are very simple, you know, you could kind of uh, deal with this in a, in a very nice and organized manner. And that way, typically these try blocks are quite large. There's loads of things that can be assembled and there's multiple things that can go wrong. Um, and by having multiple catch statements, you can then test for what has exactly gone wrong so that you then can handle these exceptions. And again, very important, as soon as you handle this specific exception, the program keeps running. The user has then this to, to continue from, but if, that, if this was kind of not a very critical exception, then at, the, at this point, it might continue running perfectly as before. Um, but there was just some exception that, uh, that uh, meanwhile occurred um, and that somehow was thrown in your try block. If you don't handle this, so if your my exception over here gets thrown, but here you catch something completely different, an integer and nothing else, in that case your program stops because there was an ex uh, exception not handled. Here is kind of the, the, the different types of things you can already use as exception objects. So you can create objects of all of these particular classes. Some of them are very recent, some of them are not so recent. And those kind of cover many, many cases you could um, uh, encounter in your programming experience. So, if, so most of the, uh, of the exceptions that you have are either from a in a logic nature or a runtime uh, nature. Um, but there's lots of other things as well, that, as you can see here. Right? So, and of course, you can then, like we saw in the previous slide, get your own class that is a child class of any of these classes as well. Right? So that's how you then, in a 
in a well-prepared manner, create your own exceptions uh, or exception handling. Now, a very specific thing are function try blocks. Um, this is kind of a, a niche thing that is, I think, not that important, but you might encounter this in some libraries, in some code that you sometimes see. That's why I, uh, I would like to handle it here as well. So function, uh, or assume here what you have, or look at what you have here. So you have a super class with a particular constructor where something can happen, and if this something something happens, then here an integer is thrown as an exception. And that's that's what what you see here at the top. Then we have a subclass which inherits everything from our super class. And then we have in our main function here an object that we create here from our subclass. And if something happens while constructing this object over here, then what we do here is we uh, call the constructor of our superclass. That's what we have. And, a con and an exception could be thrown here. But, and this might be in certain circumstances quite nice, there's no way to catch it over here. And that, and that is a problem. There is no... Uh, there's no way we can have a try-catch sequence over here because the superclass constructor is called outside or before even our constructor is, is starting with the, the body of, the, of this function that this basically is, or this methods. So in this case, there's no way to catch our exception for a child class constructor. So in this case, if the parent class or the base class throws an error in the constructor, a child class constructor or a, a, super, a, a, a subclass constructor can't catch this. And this is in some case wanted. And what you then in that case get, and this is something that only arrived a little bit later in C++, um, and probably also uh, went through a lot of discussion, is that you can put the try and catch statement outside the body of the constructor. So think of this, so th normally you would expect here curly braces, right? But no, we have the try and catch here outside this uh, where you normally would have the try and catch statement. And the reason for that is exactly what I just said. There is no other way to do this. If you're already uh, calling the superclasses constructor, then there's no way to catch this in the body, and therefore you have to do it like this, with a very special notation where try and catch are completely outside the curly braces, or around the curly braces. And this is a valid C++ notation, or syntax, uh, and just for this reason. And these are called function try blocks. So this is a way to create for a function, and it does not have to be a constructor, it could also be a destructor, it could also be a method of your class. You can formulate this try-catch statement outside the body of the function. Now, this is coming with a couple of limitations um, for reasons that I won't go into, but for instance, for a constructor, um, you can catch the statement, but you can't handle it. That means you can find out whether something is wrong. However, in that case, you have to throw still something because it needs to be handled later in our main function in the previous example. So there's no way to handle an exception here so that it stops and it doesn't perm uh, permeate wider into the, the rest of the function call. So if you have a constructor, this constructor is called by creating an object of this class. So the exception will go all the way to the point where this object is created. And that is a little bit silly, you know, obviously it would be nice if we could catch this exception right here and it does not go to our main function and is also then um, uh, raising an exception there. Mm -hmm. But it does. Even if you don't explicitly then mention this throw statement here, it will automatically create this again in a constructor in such a function try block. Right? So, and because of that, it is not always that nice. But some people really like this for certain reasons, for certain niche cases, so you might see it. But in most cases, I would try to avoid this. That's what I write down here in a little bit more uh, an elaborate uh, description. Okay, now exceptions are ways to deal with unforeseen circumstances at runtime. And this at runtime is very important because in C++, we would always like to be as efficient as it can, as it can be. 
Um, and sometimes this exception handling is creating an overhead that we would not like. However, exception handling is kind of baked into C++ already. If you have libraries, they will throw exceptions. You know, or methods in your libraries that you use will throw exceptions. And people accept from you as you start creating things in C++ to continue on that as well, to catch things or to try things, catch things, and uh, throw ex exceptions further as well. However, there are certain ways, so whenever you create functionality, a method in a class typically, or a, a function uh, in a class, then you could also explicitly say that there is no exception handling done in this function. And this is exactly what this no accept keyword does. And the, uh, the benefit that we have is in that case that we could create our entire program a little, or create, make our program a little bit more efficient. Because if we know that this function will definitely not throw exceptions, then our C++ compiler can then create a few shortcuts there and our code might become a bit faster, right? Especially if this is done throughout a larger set of codes. And this is then something that since uh, uh, version 11 uh, is available and it sometimes is making a lot of sense. So if you have um, a function and you know for sure that this could never throw an exception, then you just add no accept. And this keyword can also be used with um, an argument so you can add true, um, and this is basically uh, the same as just saying no accept. And if you have false, then you basically say no accept false, but you explicitly say that this function may throw an exception. Uh, this function may throw an exception. Strange thing is over here that I have not just a function, I have something that points to a function. Also there you can create or can mark this with this particular exception. As we've seen, sometimes we have pointers to functions. For instance, when you want to pass a function to a function. Um, in that case, also those things you can label with, this is definitely not going to uh, throw an exception, or this is definitely throwing an exception, or could throw an exception. And this is then uh, a way to explicitly tell this. So typically, these things are in the header somewhere mentioned, so that somebody who's looking at your code will immediately see this. And we'll see immediately, okay, this function over here um, will or will not throw an exception. That people immediately have this as kind of a, uh, a helper thing as well. And the C++ compiler will also use this for optimization. Very similar to how you can also add const. But this is then for security reasons. So to make sure that, for instance, if you have a const member function or const methods of a class, that this is not changing any of the attributes of the class, as you uh, probably remember. Okay, so this is, these are ways to tell more both to the compiler and to other developers, including yourself after a few weeks, because that's something that's easy to forget. Here's an example of how you could use this and how this uh, could be used. So here in this case, we have two different functions. We have a divide by, where we divide A by B. Yeah, that's what, in the end, we return. And of course, could B could be zero. That's our first example that we saw today. And if that's the case, we can throw a runtime error where we explicitly say we try to divide by zero. That is normally how you would divide. However, if you don't want this and you want uh, to explicitly handle this yourself and you want to tell everybody else, including C++, there is a guarantee that this will never throw an exception, then you can create another function which does the same, but implements this slightly different. In that case, if B is zero, this is something that we then don't throw as an exception. No, we just terminate the whole program and that's it. Right? That's a very harsh way of doing things. But in this case, we did guarantee that our function does not throw an exception. Right? Um, and since we already then ourselves output the things to CR, uh, error, error, from error, uh, so this is the console error um, thing. So basically here in the console, it will then show that, the, that we tried uh, to divide by zero. So instead of doing this as an exception, we print it out to the, out, to the error console, terminate our program, and that's it. We didn't throw an exception. And this is something you can then try out in the main function. If you use div by, which is throwing an error, it will throw an error if we divide by zero. Uh, throw an exception, sorry. 
And if we do this by save div by, then it will terminate, but it definitely will not throw an exception. That's, I think, kind of obvious. But I mean, it's, it's important still to, to visualize this and to see what the differences are. Okay, and then finally, there's, uh, um, since uh, version 11, also a way of nesting um, exceptions so that you can do the following. And I think the example kind of says what the advantages of there are. Typically, calling or raising or throwing exceptions that are being handled throughout functions that handle these more or less like a hot potato. You basically get, catch an exception and then often you throw it to the next instance. That is typically hand, uh, done a lot. Um, and typically also this, they can accumulate as well. And for the accumulation, we have this nested exception. Um, so we have, for instance, uh, two functions where an exception could be caught, where things can go wrong and we want to catch those exceptions, but only later on somehow deal with those exceptions, as you typically do in your program. So we have our uh, function run and our function open file, um, and certain things could go wrong there. We'll define what those uh, methods or functions do later. Then we have a very special function that we can create, uh, not because of its name or anything, but uh, because it's using this nested exception. And this is using polymorphism uh, on the lowest level. That's something that we will see in a second. And recursion because it's calling itself. So print exception will basically handle the exception in a hierarchical, hierarchical manner, uh, in a nested manner, I should say, and then um, catches those and then calls itself again on the next level. So you have you assume that you have uh, different levels of exceptions that are all called or all have been uh, thrown and you handle one by the other. So you start with the first level, second level, third level, etc. And with this function, we even visualize this by actually counting the level. So the level is by default zero when this uh, print exception function is called. And then well, as we go recursively into this function, the level will be increased to level one, level two, level three, etc. And that way, as soon as an exception is called, and this is then our base class uh, of uh, standard exceptions that we have, we basically then go exception by exception and handle those. And we handle those by uh, printing them out to the console error. And we kind of indent them ourselves as well over here by saying that here creates a string. This is a con construct a string of so many empty spaces. Right? So basically, if level is zero, we don't create any empty space. If level is three, we create three empty spaces here. Then we write exception, and then we call the what member function, you know, the method that we earlier saw that kind of describes what exception we have. Then we do a new line, and then we um, rethrow if this is nested into another exception. And then we go for the next exception, and the next exception, and, and so on. Right? So that's what this... Or all the magic happens in this particular function. The other functions are basically just throwing exceptions. So we have our main function who just runs or calls this run function over here. This run function tries to open a file that it definitely does not exist, which we catch here by our default catch statements, and which then throws uh, this particular very, uh, that's the difference here, this nested um, exception with this particular um, uh, object, where we have then a runtime error with this particular message. And since we try to open a file, this is uh, also going wrong over here. So over here, we try to, uh, to uh, create an object. This is raising an exception. And also here, we th uh, also again throw a nested uh, exception over here. Again, with a runtime error, but with a different error message. Right? And as you then run this, you will see that um, this, these nested exceptions get thrown uh, only once, but they get thrown and handled one by one in at the different levels. And that is for many types of exceptions quite interesting or quite, quite important to do. And again, it's a very nice illustration of polymorphism because um, we use uh, our what uh, overloaded, oper uh, not operator, uh, method here um, to take care of all of this. Okay.
that's um, the first part of what I wanted to say uh, today. The second part are, is twofold. It's basically revisiting streams, um, which we have been dealing with already from the start, uh, but adding a little bit more information there, as well as giving a follow-up for the next session, where I want to now show how difficult things can be if you don't have standard templates. Um, Streams first, however. Streams are a, a particular type of class, and we've been using that. IO stream is typically something that we include in most of our assignments and examples, um, where we want to create functionality to send characters across as input or as output. And that's it. So that is what a stream really is. Typically, a stream is, uh, is, is like, can be uh, thought of as a stream where it can go from one end to another end and send back, uh, send back things back and forward uh, between a source and a, and a destination. And the nice thing is that you don't look at how long the string is. Or so basically, you can send as many characters as you like, possibly infin an infinite amount. And then you can overlap this uh, onto something that really exists like, for instance, our console, as we have been happening, as we've been doing already. So we have a keyboard and a, and a display, that's our console. So you can get input from our keyboard or you can uh, output something on our console. And that's what we've been using with C out and C in already. Um, but we also also seen the file system already, the IF stream for input files, OF stream for output files. So we send characters to a file. And if we do this, then our file now has these characters as its content. And the other thing that I wanted to show today was a network connection. So basically a socket, you know, when a computer is talking to another computer, can of course also be a stream, or it should be a stream, because it, it, it is very similar uh, uh, to a stream, and also can be then also uh, treated as such. Now, first of all, uh, this is kind of what we can now finally uh, look at in detail because we now know what inheritance is and what classes are. Um, so again, coming back to the question, I think I put, for, uh, put here uh, uh, the first week or the second week, C in or C out, those are objects of classes that are of type O stream or I stream. Those are the generic input or output stream classes, which are again base classes of, uh, or subclasses of the IO stream class, IOS, which is again a child class of this parent class IOS underscore base. A little bit convoluted, but this is how it's handled in C++. Uh, IOS base is kind of an abstraction that does not look at what is being sent across this is only then formulated in iOS. Over here, we use a character. There's also white characters that you can use, but we'll completely ignore those for the reasons I already told you when we, once we were looking at white characters and characters. I think we used that in string, or we told this in the string chapter. Right, so you have input stream, output stream, uh, and, or output stream, and input output stream. So a stream that does both in and output. Um, typically, you also have Next to that, a stream buffer, which is kind of a, a data structure, a container, as we'll see in a second, uh, where we can store things intermediately and then take things from. Um, but important is that streams are just handling characters. They take a, or you can put a character into a stream so it then arrives at its destination. And this could be our console, so the character is then displayed. It could be a file, so the character is stored on the file. It could be a socket, so the character is sent across the internet, but inherently all of those streams are just streams. And they all use very similar methods to do this. Um, and that is the nice thing. So we do have also uh, file streams. We also have strings, so we can send characters to a string. Right? That's another thing that I just forgot. Um, and as we will see, um, we'll have in a second also um, sockets. But for that you would then need a little bit more. Now what typically streams have is a get and a put uh, method to write a single character to the stream or get a single character from the stream. Um, you can do this in a formatted way. So if you have a certain amount of data, you can read this data straight away as a block or you can write this data straight away as a block or as a line. And as a line, you basically read until a certain special character, which is usually called the delimiter, is met and then it stops reading. 
So it's kind of like a flexible reading. If I want to create or if I want to capture a sentence, then I use get line. So basically, as soon as I start typing, whether those are empty spaces or not, or words, uh, it will all collect those until I press enter. Then I have my new line, and this new line is the limiter that getLine was looking for, and then getLine will return with all the characters that were typed until I, start, I pressed uh, enter. You can also choose the delimiter so that you can also wait for another type of, uh, of character that is found. Um, and that is then uh, a nicer way in certain applications. And of course, we have our operators, our insertion operator and extraction operator, they're called. Um, and we know already how this is used, right? So see out, you send something to that. So you use this one, see out this one, or see in is then sending something to a variable that we then catch. Um, or a string. All right, so as promised, here is a very quick and dirty example that is uh, immediately uh, put out as an assignment just to try and play around with for you at home, um, which is using the most important library there is in C++ for uh, sockets called Boost, um, which you would need to install first, and that's why I have these three peppers typically, because it's not always that easy. Um, and you would also need to link this library as well. So this would be the way to get to the right header file for Boost in that case. But before you get there, it's sometimes, depending on your platform, on a Mac I can attest this is not always that easy. Especially if you have the newer architecture that is M1, uh, uh, that needs to be M1 compliant. Right, so this doing uh, this installation is really what uh, uh, acquires the three peppers. It's not uh, following this assignment over here. That is, or should be, uh, already easy. So basically what I would like you to do is uh, learn or use the knowledge that you had from your exception handling um, uh, uh, in the past, in the, fa in the previous chapter, and use this knowledge over here. Um, so throw an exception, catch this exception, if there are file or connection problems. And there might be, because what this uh, pro program does is basically it creates a socket, which is immediately then opening a connection to this particular website, example.com, you might know this one already. It's, it is an actual server, uh, which is following HTTP um, a protocol. And um, I create also a file, an output file, uh, that's again what you can see with OF stream, uh, which I call my test.txt. And uh, I will already write in this file reply of server, colon, next line. So that's kind of setting things up. Then I create a, a bit of a buffer, like a, an array of characters of a certain size. And then I send, and this is our stream notation that we already know, this particular string to our server. So this is some, I mean, I, the computer science students of you should definitely know this. Um, this is basically part of the protocol of HTTP. So we basically get here locally um, uh, our connection to our web server. And what we should get back is in the reply from our web server, namely the web page that we are now asking. So we're doing the job of a browser here, basically, right? And then we connect, uh, close the connection. Um, why you need those um, return, new line, return, new lines, that is something for you to read up on, uh, but that is not the most important thing. Then we flush this, and then it gets sent to our server. So then we can read it. Also, this, this read is another method that we just saw, right, that belongs to a stream uh, into our reply, into our buffer of a particular size. So at most, in this case, 4,096 bytes, um, it's a nice number, basically uh, are being read in this case. And that's then our web page, hopefully, that is then being stored and that we then put straight to our file. Right? So in this case, it's a very nice example, I think, of streams because we stream first our, um, our get commands over HTTP to a server somewhere on the internet, most likely in the US. We get back our result, our reply, and store that via another stream into a file. So in this case, I try to avoid the typical I.O. stream, C out, and C in streaming, because that is becoming slightly boring. Um, and basically to show that, uh, or the way that works is um, over here. Uh, for that, I need to remember how I compiled it. Uh, let me check. 
we have to go back in time. Oh, was it there already? No. Uh, this is a while ago. Ah, there we go. So for me, I have to include this particular library, which is in this particular location. Um, in an IDE, you would have to still add this somewhere, un uh, unless you have a very good installer for Boost. Um, but if you then compile it, it usually should then compile, and eventually then should generate our executable that we can then run. And once our executable is run, we can also then look at um, our file. What is it called? My tests over here and they can see what contents of our file are. So reply of server is something that we wrote to our file ourselves, but everything else over here is what the server, the example.com server sent back to us. So it sent a couple of uh, commands over HTTP, right? Then it closed the connection as we asked it to, and then it sends the HTML code back to us, right? And that is then the, the website that we then have. And of course, we then create or we can remove then uh, all the lines that are not so important over here, then just leave out the HTTP um, or HTML code over here. So we leave out everything else that was left or put there by the server in our reply. Save that as um, an HTML file. And then if you go to the right directory, very streams, we have an HTML file, we can open it and then look at what this website looks like. Right? So that's completely then different. But uh, as you can see, that's something that, um, that works. It might also not work. If you don't have a connection to the internet, for instance, it will fail, you will need an exception. If the, your file system is borked, also there you will need an exception. That is one of the things we ask here. The other thing we ask you to change is to store it as an HTML file, not as a text file. So what I just did by hand, you will need to do in an automated way in your program. All that together, I think, will keep you half an hour busy. That's what I think. Well, we'll see. Right, now the final part that I wanted to um, uh, introduce are container classes. Now, every, or most of C++ is already there, right? Or no, most of the things we would like to have in C++ are already there. And many of those are container classes, such as vectors or arrays of a particular type, so not the standard arrays, or trees or graphs that are already available and that are implemented in the most efficient, nicest way possible. And next time we'll see that we can use those with templates, so we can use those for any type of class or type that there is. That will be very nice. But I think the best way to illustrate why those are nice is to illustrate it the hard way by seeing how you would do this without. Um, so a container class is something where you want to contain in a particular manner data of the same type. So uh, as objects of a particular class, or the integers, or as floating points, numbers, etc. And then those containers typically have a particular behavior. They could be, for instance, uh, working like an array, as we already saw. You have basically um, an n amount of uh, slots, and any of those slots can be addressed directly, and you can get and set that data from those slots. That's kind of what an array is. You can also have a tree, where data is basically linked to multiple other pieces of data. Those can also be linked to other pieces of data, and that way, as like a tree, it kind of fans out. Um, or as a list, or as a queue, or as a stack, all of those things you'll probably know from your bachelor degree, I hope. Now, if you want to create a queue of integers, which is a fairly simple thing to do typically, um, it does actually require a bit of work. Because for a queue, remember from your bachelor degree, queue is more or less like a tower of Lego blocks that you turn 90 degrees. And if you add a block, you add it to the end, right? Like a queue, if you stand in front of where do we have queues? At the Mensa, for instance, uh, sometimes then you uh, add yourself to the queue of, uh, at the back, at the tail of the queue, and the person who is then getting the food first is the person in front of the queue, at the head of the queue, right? A flashback to your bachelor degree. Um, and then basically those operations that are associated with those are the puts and the gets uh, commands, right? So you basically put a new person to the queue at the end, and you get a new person away from the queue from the front. 
And then you get this person as well. You get the contents uh, of, of this queue con uh, container. So that's what a queue or how a queue is functioning. And you want to, uh, typically there's very good uh, reasons why you want a queue. Queue is also called a first in, first out or FIFO buffer. For many uh, applications, this is the best container type that you can have. So imagine that you want to store a couple of integers and you want to have a queue. Also there, I remind you that a queue is, can be blowing up and can be shrinking in size, like a normal queue at the Mensa. Um, and also this needs to be a behavior that uh, this queue needs to have. So if we want to imp uh, implement this, this queue, we implement this of course nowadays as a class, since we know how to do that, where we have a constructor which initializes some uh, attributes that we start, and when, once we have a destructor, while we remove, uh, or while we go out of the function that used our queue, we then delete, and you can see already our dynamic array, <coughs> Um, and then set a couple of other options here. We have our put and get methods over here, put for putting a new integer into our queue, and get for returning the integer um, whose turn it is at the moment, right? And then we have some helper functions or methods that check for us whether the queue is full, whether the queue is empty, and for clearing the entire queue. And the clearing is uh, then done at uh, a particular time, okay. And then for our private attributes that you know, users should never really be worried about is we have our head and our tail. Those are just integers which are kind of uh, pointing at uh, or the locations in the array, in the dynamic array that we have where our tail and the head of our queue are starting. We have the size of our queue. We have the maximum size of our queue. And we have the pointer to an uh, integer array that is then dynamically constructed. So as soon as we create a queue, by default, it's size 100, but it could also be of another size. We create a dynamic array. Um, that's what you see over here. Um, so uh, we create a new array of integers of a particular size that we supply, right? And then when we create or when we put uh, a new element into our queue, because in the beginning it is still empty, head and tail are still pointing to location zero. Um, then after a while, when you put new data in, um, what it will look like is like this. So from here, oh, oops, sorry. In this element, this element, this element, and this element, there's some data, and we want to put a new element in at the end of the queue. Then we say, okay, where the tail location was, we put this new element in, and then we move this tail to the next one. And this we keep on doing until we reach the end of our array. So this is my depiction of an array, uh, which is called items, right? And if we then move to the end of the array, it overlaps to the beginning again. And that is what you see over here with our module operator, right? So our head is always in front or equal to the tail, and both of, both of them move to the right. If they go to the end of the array, they swap to the beginning again, and they continue. So the maximum size of numbers that we can store here is the size of items. I hope it's clear, right? And that's why or how we can implement this but method in that case. So it's basically putting at a certain element or location in our array this new integer, and then it's uh, uh, incrementing the tail, and then probably going uh, and then at a, some point in time going back to the first element of the array. Right. So with this limited array in our memory, we kind of created now a queue that can shrink and inflate depending on how many things we put and we get from this. And getting is then returning an integer. It basically looks at the, the number that was here at the head already. We return this number and then increment the head to the next one. Uh, that is more or less in uh, normal language and a bit of uh, sketches uh, what is happening here and how we implement this on a lower level. So when you create this type of queue, um, oops, sorry, when you create this type of queue, on the lower level, our queue class is creating in memory a dynamic area of a certain size, which is our maximum size of the queue. And then through this rotation over our array, we can then have a queue of a particular size that shrinks and inflates as we put or get things from that uh, queue. And we get always the right value back. We put always the value at the right location, right? So it has all the behavior of a queue. Now, this is one way of uh, creating a queue. 
Um, and uh, the way it works is kind of uh, almost completely hidden to the user. However, the user needs to give the size, the maximum size of this queue. And this might be in many, uh, on many occasions a bit of a limitation because users of our queue, the people when they want to create an object of our queue, would need to know how big this queue is going to be. And this might be sometimes problematic. So there is another way of implementing this. And this would be, for instance, true to linked lists that you probably already have seen as well in your bachelors. Um, in that case, we create our own small class for, for storing one integer called QElement. And it looks like this. So it has some data, which is an integer. And it has a pointer to, a ne to another QElement, which we call next. Now that's how linked lists typically work. And then our head and our tail, are it's much nicer visually, right, as the, our previous implementation, are pointers as well. So whenever we create our queue and we add, we put a number in, or we put somebody into the queue, then we create a queue element in memory, and our head is pointing to that particular queue element, and our tail then as well. And if a new number is added to that, then the next pointer of that previous element, that's the one that the tail is pointing to, is then pointing to this newly created uh, queue element as well, and so on, right? So for one step, this is the before status, once we arrive here at the code, if we then add a new uh, element to it, then we create this first of all, then we let the pointer of the previous element that tail was pointing at point to this new element, and then tail is incremented to this new element as well. So it's not pointing to this anymore, it's pointing to this. And through head and tail, we can then put and get these elements. And that's all we need to do for a queue. Right? So this linked list is a really nice implementation. Again, quickly, because there's not that much time anymore, or I wanted to not make it too long today, um, or, or getting uh, um, uh, something from the queue is exactly the same. You look at where the head is pointing to, that is this queue element over here. You get back the result from that, which is a 6. That is what is put into V over here. And then you delete this Q element, and then head is pointed to the next element over here. OK, so that is the new uh, way. And this is kind of then a new type of Q implementation. The nice thing about this Q implementation, which we call UQ for unlimited Q, is that it kind of can fill up your entire memory. right? And you don't need, as a user, to provide this size while, while you construct this queue. That is the cool thing. And if you look at the class itself, it is much more elegant as well, I would imagine. Right? Of course, it's using pointers, so might be a little bit allergic to that, but is, as a way to kind of um, program this, and as a way to use this, is a lot more efficient. And that is, that's, I hope, something that is clear. Uh, as you see this, so head and tail are first pointed to the null pointer, and as you then uh, continue, you basically can put and get uh, um, to uh, changing the pointers and creating those elements. Now we need to first say that there is this such a thing as queue elements, but then this would be, for instance, the header file typically. And this would show people, you put things into your queue elements, um, and your queue is then basically, uh, or there is this queue element, but that's what users don't need to use. They just use UQ objects, and they can use then put and get as we saw before. And that's all. So the queue element on the lowest level is basically the data, that's an integer, the pointer to the next element, as promised, and then a constructor to create this. Right? That, is, that is what a queue element is doing. And um, for our queue methods, you know, clearing means that we iteratively go through all the queue elements through our linked list and delete them one by one in a for loop. Note here the for loop. This is not like the typical int e equals zero, e is smaller than a particular value, and an i plus um, plus. This has, is using our pointers in this case, and we, uh, we um, iterate through the pointer. So the pointer is going always to the next um, Q element and then deleting that uh, element. Also, an interesting uh, um, way to solve this, I think, with pointers. Um, is empty is easy. If the head is null, then our queue is empty. To put something on there is basically creating a new queue element. If our queue is not empty, then we say that the tail is uh, becoming the tail uh, the next uh, that, that the next pointer was uh, pointing at. Um, 
and that's it, right? And then getting is very simple as well. If it is not empty, um, then we let our um, head uh, point, our head point to the next element in our linked lists, and we return whatever value we got from that. Over here is then being returned. And here we actually do um, throw um, a, a problem if there is a problem. If our uh, queue is empty and we want to get something, then we just basically throw this uh, particular runtime error. Okay, and that is it. So basically that's all I wanted to show. Why I wanted to show this is, I think, hopefully already clear. It's a lot of work to create these things in the optimal way possible. This is just an example for a simple queue. And if you want to change this for a queue of floating points, I would have to change our class, right? Our elements, queue elements. If I would have to uh, make a queue here of um, GPS coordinates, I would again be having a problem, right? I would have to do this again. So that's why there is such a thing called templates that we'll see next time, which abstracts this for us, where we can say there is such a thing that is a queue that is, for instance, programmed exactly like this. But instead of saying this is a queue of integers, we can say this is a queue of a particular type. Types include also the classes that we can build ourselves. And then things become a little bit nicer detached. We can create vectors, graphs, trees, queues, lists, or whatever type of container of whatever type of type. We kind of deconstruct those two away from each other. And that is basically what a template allows us to do. So more about that next time uh, when we talk about templates. That's all for today. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, yeah, we will have uh, the written test in a second or a written assignment in a second in 10 minutes. Okay, thank you for your attention.